Hello, I'm Chris Burns, and welcome to The Network, where we connect into a matrix of newsmakers to get to the heart of an issue. And watch out, they've got to answer in 25 seconds or less, or else. Let's take a look at that issue right now. It was a long, hard road for Croatia to qualify for European Union membership. Only the second former Yugoslav Republic to join after a decade of negotiations, reforms at home, and the arrests of suspected war criminals. Now, as Croatia becomes the 28th member state in July, attention turns to the next potential members in waiting. But waiting for how long? The Big Bang of 10 nations joining in 2004 caused enlargement fatigue. On Croatia alone, the EU spent 1 billion euros since 2007 on projects including infrastructure as well as rural and regional development. As austerity bites at home, EU leaders are hard-pressed to justify largesse to EU candidate countries. Though in the Balkans, the prospect of EU membership has been a powerful glue that has made the peace stick. How large should the EU be? And what are the chances for Turkey to join, especially as a people power rebellion tests the government's commitment to modernize and democratize? Now, wired into this edition of the network is here from uh, in Brussels at the Brussels Bureau of Euro News is Stefan Fühle, Commissioner for Enlargement and European Neighborhood Policy. Here at the European Parliament in Brussels, Selim Yenel, Turkish ambassador to the EU, and also from the European Parliament, Dusko Lopandic, Serbian ambassador to the EU. We have two of the five candidate countries with us here today, and we've agreed to be on first-name basis. Uh, let me start with a question for all of you, starting with uh, Stefan. One billion euros for Croatia, as you saw in the report. How can the EU afford to expand further? How do they justify, in the eyes of the taxpayer here, to do that? I think what is important to look at the result uh at the, the end uh, of this one billion euro, we have a country which is fully prepared to, to become the 28 member states uh, to strengthen the European Union. I would say it was a, a wise investment. Let's go to Selim. Uh, do, do you agree with that? Well, of course. I mean, enlargement is beneficial for everybody, for the candidate and for the EU itself. And that's why we think that if Turkey joins, it would be an added value to the Union. Uh, we feel that we have much to give. And we will, of course, uh, be benefiting it uh, as well. We have already benefited. But wait a minute now. Croatia is 4 million people. Turkey is how many? 60? 76. Dusko? How many? You, how do you justify that in the eyes of the taxpayer? Come for, on. for Serbia, for example, the, the money that's been spent from the budget, for which we are very thankful, is about 0.1% of uh, EU budget. So in terms of the benefits, I think it's worthwhile because uh, uh, everybody at the end is profiting this. Okay, but we're in the middle of, a, of an economic and financial crisis here in Europe, uh, Stefan. How do you combat this enlargement fatigue amid this economic crisis? How do you do that? You know, there are uh, a lot of talks about the enlargement fatigue, uh, but uh, it's like talking about Yeti. I mean, everybody is talking about it, but no one has uh, seen uh, the issue is that the enlargement is not a part of the problem. It's a part of, uh, of the solution. And if I see a certain fatigue, it's not uh, on the side of the member state, uh, but it's uh, on the reform side uh, of some candidate and aspirant uh, uh, countries. Uh, let, let, let me go to you, uh, uh, Selim. I mean, we're still digesting this Big Bang of 2004. Um, how do you think we can continue with this expansion and we're still not yet digesting all of those countries yet. How do you justify that? Well, uh, if and ever Turkey joins the Union, it won't be overnight. We still have a number of things to do, or a number of reforms, and uh, probably it'll take us a number of years. And I hope that the EU fatigue will be gone by then, and that uh, also uh, economically we might be helping the EU. Uh, right now they're going through a euro crisis, and I'm sure that by the time Turkey joins, we'll be economically so good. It'll be over for them. Okay, let me, let, let me switch gears a bit now. Th there is the argument that there's more pressure on countries to reform before their members than after. We've seen some problems later after membership. Dushko, do, do you agree that, that that pressure, maybe you need that pressure internally to do that? Well, probably. You know that uh, when people are asked uh, about these questions, they, uh, for example, they, they answer that anyway reforms that, that are part of our EU process 
uh, should be done uh, even without European Union. So I think in general those, uh, those reforms uh, which, which are uh, suggested by European Union are, are uh, acceptable for population. But there are some difficult things to do. That's yeah, true. exactly. Ste Stefan, we've learned some lessons now since that Big Bang. There are some countries that are dragging their feet after membership on carrying out certain reforms. Are there regrets there? And is that making you much more cautious? Has that changed the approach for these new candidates? No regrets, uh, maybe not even cautious, but definitely paying uh, much uh, uh, more uh, attention, bigger attention to the credibility of uh, the whole process. The enlargement should be the policy which takes the lessons learned very seriously. And if you look at Croatia, uh, that has undergone uh, through a certain element, no country uh, uh, has uh, undergone before. Uh, a new benchmarks, a new approach like the track record rather than sort of ticking the boxes. Selim, uh, I, I believe you're, you're hoping to open up a new chapter in these accession talks. How hopeful are you about that in, in the context also of what's going on in Turkey now? Well, I mean, it's been three years since we opened any, any chapter and the French have lifted their blockage on this one, regional policy, chapter 22. Now we hope that this will be uh, taken up. We don't wish any hiccups here and there. So we hope that things will proceed accordingly. Okay, all right. And, and, and Dushko, uh, what about the sticking points? You've got ethnic tensions, corruption, organized crime, judicial reform. That's, that's a big deal, big thing to deal with, as the Croatians also dealt with. How hopeful well, are you? There is a, a, a large improvement and progress in, in Serbia and the, in the Balkans in the last couple of years despite all difficulties that you mentioned. Uh, Serbia, as you know, is a candidate since one year. We are, we are looking forward and we prepared uh, a lot of things for, for negotiations, including uh, the issue that is the most difficult. This is dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina, which is right. going on. Kosovo, right. Yes. And, and, and so you, you think that can be worked out. But Stefan, I mean, th this has been a big problem for a long time. Not uh, only is Serbia has delivered uh, on the membership criteria, but it also delivered uh, on this key priority defined by the Commission and the Member States, and it is to uh, normalize and improve the relationship between Bergat uh, and Pristina. The, okay. the, the political deal has been reached on the 19th of, of April. The process is to continue so implementation and further steps, but those further steps should be done within the accession process. Selim, uh, we, we do have to mention this about the, uh, this sort of, some people call a Turkish spring going on. And what kind of effect can that have on your accession process? Could it speed it? Could it impede it? Well, what we've seen now is democracy at work in Turkey. Uh, this is something that has been the result of the reforms in Turkey. Turkey is now a much more open society, talks about everything. And these last events have shown that actually uh, we've seen people uh, take to the streets, show how they have uh, their, let's say, uh, wishes, and the government has listened. And, and but it Prime depends Minister, kind of how this plays out. The Prime Minister has said that, look, you know, this is a test, has, has been a test for everybody, and uh, we are committed to the reforms. Just last weekend we had the reform monitoring group uh, we're go going uh, the, the, the reforms that have taken place. We are committed to it, no matter what. Dushko, the Balkan tinderbox, if this, if this accession process slows down, could that be dangerous? Is there a need for speed in the Balkans to join the EU? Absolutely, I agree with you. I think that Balkans need kind of uh, a new political economic framework, and this framework is exactly European Union, which is, not, which is both... Uh, a uh, project for peace and project for, for growth. Okay, big can of worms, Stefan, last question. How big should the EU be? As big as the member states uh, want to have it. Uh, but there is an Article 49 talking about the European uh, uh, state uh, uh, who could become the member states if it sort of promote the values and principle the European Union uh, uh, sort of is based on. And there is a political will of the member states and where those two sort of elements uh, meet each other. This is uh, how you define uh, the next uh, size of the European Union. Thanks very much, Stefan. And I'd like to thank all of our guests, Stefan Frühle, Selim Yanel, and Dushko Lopandic. I'm Chris Burns. And until next time, thanks for connecting with The Network.